Kung, I want to start by saying that I'm probably never going to go again to check out your Instagram because I always get a little bit scared, a little bit more scared every time I go there because it's like the world is closing in and people are getting very violent nowadays. I don't know if it's because of the COVID, if it's because of the all the tribalism that's going on, but uh, I'm obviously joking. This This is actually one thing that I think people should be aware of. And you always talk about people themselves, ourselves being our first responders. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your raising awareness of the violence that's going on in the world? Well, you know, um, first of all, um, because I'm Asian and when all this first started, there was a lot of Asians being, you know, like uh, being victims of hate crimes, victims of uh, bullying, right? So, um I, I figure I would try to help out and educate people about being their first responder, you know? So um, I started like a fight or flight, fight or flight uh, show. And then uh, I actually rebooted that and I just started doing more stuff on the, um, you know, like Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I've, I've been checking it out and uh, it's, it's always a little bit of a, uh of an eye-opener because people uh, sometimes they believe that they're safe and uh, that everything is going okay and it's only stuff that's going on in the media, but the media is really very, uh, um, it's, it's, it, it, there's a tendency in the media to only portray a couple of things, but I know that there's a lot much more going on in the world. And I also feel that the new generations, it's, I'm talking like an old person, but the new generations are very entitled. And when I listen to the life story of somebody like you who had to struggle really hard to get to where they, they got, I mean, you're one of my idols. And uh, I would like to say that um, I, I, Thank you. I've already heard once or twice your life story, but I would really like you to t tell it to my listeners. So you were born in Vietnam. And uh, what happened from there until you started practicing martial arts? I was born uh, on May 25th, uh, 1972. And um, I left uh, out of the um, Vietnam um, during the fall of Saigon. And basically, my grandfather was the chief police and the U.S. government said that they couldn't protect us anymore. And, um, you know, we had two hours to go back and get one luggage each and you know and leave oh my so God. my grandfather took the chance and got us all back and we left and 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 you know basically we we're in three different refugee camps and we started over we are that typical um asian family that um you know the 13 14 to a house a uh, four bedroom um house and um, my grandparents had one room my grand my great grandmother had um uh, one room so the uncles and the aunts shared a room so I was with the aunts because my mom you know I was uh, I was uh, like the first of the family you know and um, it was uh, definitely crazy you know we we were those like you know fresh off the boat <laughs> you know so yeah um, and you know coming here to America a lot of kids didn't understand what happened or a lot of people didn't understand what happened so um, you know they they took it out on us and um, you know, being uh, being being a refugee, not knowing um, you know any English, it, it was tough. It was tough, and you know, once I started school, I, I had a little bit of a uh, English foundation, and but I couldn't communicate that well. But I got bullied until my mom says, "Okay, that's, that's it. You got to learn how to defend yourself." And she put me in martial arts when I was ten, and then uh, you know. Um, I, I was the one for the first to throw punches, you know, I didn't wait. I just threw punches. And once I got into wrestling, it just, it was a different story, you know? Wow. Wow. So how, how old were you when you got to the U S well, I, I was probably by the time with all the refugee camps, I, I was already three years old. Uh -huh. Um, um, you know, being in, in the U S and, uh, you know, being, uh, we also had to stay in a refugee camp in the U S then we got a sponsor in um in monterey and so we stayed in monterey for a bit you know so uh -huh. and uh do, do you at that time have any recollection do you still have any recollection of anything because i i have no idea when i first 
began, you know, my first memories, I have no idea which, which ones they were, but you being in such a turmoil, do you have any recollection at three years old of being somewhere or coming to the, uh, or going to the United States? You know, um, I don't remember that part, but I do remember every time my mom had to leave to work. Mm -hmm. She had to work a lot. She had to make ends meet and at the same time go to college, you know, and because, you know, like she already had a four year degree, but then she had a, I don't know what, what program she was in, but she had to do, you know, a few more years to, to finish up, to, to get, you know, credentials over here. And at the same time, she was working two, sometimes three jobs, you know, oh. so it was uh, definitely hard for her. And, um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't say it was hard for me because I was the, like the baby of the family and everyone treated me um, good. But like I was definitely, you know, bullied a lot in um, when I went to school. And uh, I just, you know, it, it helped me become the person that I am. And I feel blessed. And, you know, I thank God every day for, you know, being able to wake up and, you know, see a roof over my head and, and uh, you know, food in the refrigerator to feed my kids, you know, and my family. Oh, what, ama what an amazing life story. And what was the first experience in the martial arts? Which, which was the first one? First uh, experience in the martial arts when I was probably 10 years old and there was Taekwondo and... You know, it, it wasn't much of an experience because my mom was consistent for a couple weeks, but then she picked up another job. And after the, she got another job, you know, I every time I showed up, it was like once in a blue moon and all of a sudden a test came up. And I'm like, hey, um, how come everyone's yellow belt now? How come, you know, then when I did take <laughs> my test, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I even passed, you know, because I, I wasn't there to learn, you know, yeah. you know enough to to pass the test. Yeah, so so you you were already having your lesson at 10 years old that consistency is key. <laughs> If you're not consistent, yep. <laughs> you're not going to get any yellow belts much less black belts. Uh so but yeah. I guess that that uh, uh that starts in the in the taekwondo uh, which is uh, like 90% kicking really helped you along the way because the first that you do will probably your Can you call it your foundation or not so much? It's, do you, if you had to say well, that you your know, foundation I didn't get I, I didn't get a chance to really, uh, really like dedicate myself, oh, right? Okay. But I, I got to say, wrestling is my okay. first foundation. But then after my second year of college, I went back to Taekwondo. And um, then also at the same time, the teacher was teaching Vietnamese Kung Fu, you know? And then, then I found the art of Sanda, or at the time it was called San Sho, which is r fighting off a raised platform and as an amateur, right? So. Um, you know, there I um, went undefeated in, in, in America. And then um, when I went to the world championships, you know, I, I, I took bronze. So I, you know, had my first uh, loss. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I lost against the defending world champion. And then then, then the following um, world championships, they have it every other year. Um, in Rome, uh, you know, I didn't consider that a loss. I was against in the semifinals against um a local i think iran he was really uh, oh. of a slick fighter but um i i was just too powerful and too um like all my like you know in 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 senda or sancho they score a lot of points i was more like everything every, every time i kicked or i i punched or i threw someone i was either getting a knockout or hurting them uh -huh. so i would dominate but then he did a spinning back kick At the same time, I was trying to throw a low kick, and when I hit him in the growing, which I didn't hit him in the growing because you can easily, you know, play it back, and you can see that I hit him uh, right above, uh, like underneath the, the growing, thigh. and yeah. I table topped him, and then, um, <laughs> and they they disqualified me, and I already had beaten um, the toughest fighter in the tournament from Belarus, you know, um, in 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 the quarterfinals, you know, and I just felt like, you know, they didn't want me to. You know, um, they didn't want anyone from the U.S. to win, even though I was Asian, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. you know, it is what it is. Yeah, so the, there's a lot of politics in, in the fighting sports, and I'm sure that you've yeah. had enough of that. And I know of your of your, of your your quarrel with, with the UFC and Dana White and stuff, but uh, let's not get into that just yet. But uh, um, what is the difference? I know that Sandai and Sancho are the, are, are the fighting 
parts of uh, Chinese martial arts, like uh, uh, the forms are the sequences. And I, I, I did actually, I started practicing wushu when I was nine years old. But uh, can you tell the audience what is the difference between Sancho and Sanda? Or is there any difference? Well, like here's like wushu, right? Wushu uh -huh. is divided into two, cat two categories, um, how I was taught. One is Tao Lu, which is the forms <clears throat> and, you know, the 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 like the the in, uh, internal style like qigong or tai chi and then they had san san show or san da but uh, san show at the time um was the amateur where you fight off the raised platform and then eventually they realized hey you know this is entertainment so they started getting professional um you know fights going and they called that sanda so that that's kind of like how i you know, pieced it together. You know, I didn't, I don't, I don't speak Chinese, but um, I was really into it. So I started competing and, um, you know, going to all, every single tournament I could in Sancho where there's a raised platform. And then uh, um, I actually, then I found Draka, which is the same style, but you can punch multiple times to the head and um, you fight inside a ring. So I, you know, I fought two fights in Draka, got, um, uh, unanimous decision on the first one. Mm -hmm. Then knocked out, um, you know, a guy from Japan, who who um, was one of the first Japanese to win in Lampini Stadium, uh, Lampini Stadium against um, uh, like a Thai champion, uh, Monaro Taro. And then uh, you know, um, I guess that's when I met with Scott, and you know, Scott started promoting me in Strike Force, and the rest is history, you know. Yeah, because a lot of people don't know this, but you had about a hundred fights before you went on to mixed martial arts, um, and you you said in an interview I heard you saying that uh, you had to raise the money to go uh, to all these different countries and do those fights. So I was like, Yeah, how did he how did he do it? I mean, uh, what did you do for money back then to to get enough money to go and struggle and go all the way through to get all those about a hundred fights before you actually went on to MMA? Well. Not just uh, like a uh, hundred. This was all amateur fights, right? So I I had to pay for the entry fee. Oh yeah. I had to pay for the travel fee. Oh goodness. You no. Know? So I mean, a lot of it, of course. You know, you know, my mom and my aunt, and my uncle, everyone like really sponsored me. But I, I, you know, I still needed like food, money, and so I did a lot of sponsorship. I did a lot of door to door. I did a lot of uh, car washes. I did a lot of uh, pizza drive. I did a lot of like you know selling like t shirts and. And stuff like that. So I, I just, you know, I, I was that guy who rolled up my sleeve and, and did what I had to, to just to get to the tournaments. And, you know, sometimes, you know, <clears throat> when you don't make the ends meet, you just get to the tournament. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's like that. Uh, <laughs> it was almost embarrassing. But, you know, like <laughs> you go with the like, you, you know, you, you go with a couple guys that, you know, and, you know, you get your own room. But, you know, there you walk down the. The you know the the hallway of the elevator and you're like oh look there's there's a slice of pizza someone left out there they didn't finish you know and you're just like hey I'm hungry I'm gonna eat it you know so, <laughs> screw it <laughs> yeah, yeah screw it I mean you, know? you have to right <laughs> yep no no yep. organic free range stuff for no, for no, someone not, who's, who's not, struggling not right back then <laughs> yeah there's a lot yeah. there's a lot of eat what you could you know uh -huh, so uh -huh. just to be at the tournament. The first time I so, saw the first time I saw you was uh, before the fight you did with Jason Yi. You did a couple of fights with him, am I right? You did two fights with him or just one? I did one with him. Oh, the by one. then I was already running my own school, so I was doing well. Um, so you know, I was more into like promoting the arts, but like before that was pretty rough. Cause yeah. I because as, as a young kid watching those magazines like Inside Kung Fu magazine and Kung Fu Qigong Wushu, there was this, uh, th yeah, there was this, this magazine called uh, Kung Fu uh, Qigong Wushu. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure yeah. if my Chinese is correct, but uh, and, uh, in that magazine, you had like an article, you against Jason Yi, telling the backgrounds of each one. And I was like, God, did, these guys look like... They're the, the real action men of, you guys look like, it, it's like the perfect movie fight for real. So I was like, oh, I want to be like these guys. Yeah. They look so good yeah, and so yeah. tough and so muscular and whatnot. So this is obviously a, a, a conditioning and a fitness channel as well. So I would like to know, 
in terms of conditioning, not just the, the technical stuff of the martial arts, or if you could run us by a typical day of yours during the competitive years, how was it like? How was it like? How tough was it? And how did you divide the training portion in terms of the technical stuff for the um, the Sancho or the MMA and the conditioning in, for example, the gym or the running? Well, you know, like as a as an amateur, and, and I was um, still with the, the the my my old traditional coach. So there was a lot of like leapfrogs, a lot of um, you know, like body body weights, like tons of pull ups, upside down push ups, uh, clapping push ups. But then um, nice. when I opened up my own gym, I uh, started taking it more scientifically doing bleachers uh, mm -hmm. with all the wrestling that I, I've done in the past and all the conditioning drills that I was doing in wrestling. I started implementing the wrestling and and the, the stand-up together and the conditioning where, you know, I would run these crazy mountains we call one was, um, uh, we call it Suncrest. And that's like on Piedmont Road. Uh, right, here's White Road and it turns Piedmont, that, that hill, you can see it from the road. It, it's like one mile up, and that's really intense. And then we have a uh, this park called Alum Rock, where it, like you run this trail twice. That's like almost five miles, but like it's all kinds of crazy winery road. But like you get to this area where it just you think it's over, then you turn the corner and this big one big hill, and so uh, just a lot of crazy conditioning. And when I did, um, you know, start to turn pro. I started like do, doing bleachers with my students on my back, and and then coming down the, uh, you know, coming down the bleachers and kicking tie pads. You can see that um, my uh, my one of my world champions. Um, she's a female fighter, Elena Maxwell. She uh, she yeah. she posted. Um, it's called making of a champion, and uh, you know, and it just showed me training and and uh, doing all kinds of stuff. So oh, I was doing nice. a lot I'm of stuff. I'm gonna link it. I'm gonna link it. Yeah. Like now, right? So, um, uh, so I, I, you know, I felt like just I wanted to be different. I wanted to, you know, um, take my training to another level. And then, you know, I, I got with a few coaches that kind of burned me out a little bit. And then, then, then when I did go MMA, I went to Javier Mendez, aka, and you know, and we just um, uh, collaborated really well. And then his camp got really big, and so I really had a take a step back because I was getting a little bit older. I couldn't, you know, my body wasn't recovering the way it was. And so, you know, I just said, uh, there's only so much I can do here at this gym. And I have to take my training to like a different, you know, approach so I can have a little bit more longevity. And so we, I worked with Javier for, you know, um, you know, uh, most of my uh, MMA fights, you know, and then uh, a couple fights that, when I went to Macau, like by that time he was just way too busy. So, you know, I just ended up using one of my, um, my, my, someone I fought, but as a, a really good friend of mine, uh, Scott Cheeley, who trained Matt Brown, you know, so, and then, uh, and I use, uh, Gary Owens, who is another trainer at AKA. So, you know, I, I kept it in the family, but, you know, um, when, when the coach has all those champions, you know, he, he can't spread himself out too thin. So, you know, you just gotta, um, you know, you just got to go with it. Did you at that point uh, segment a lot? Like, for example, wrestling in the morning and kickboxing in the in the afternoon and conditioning in the evening, something like that, or not so much? You know, um, when I when I was over at AK, I did that. But then for my last couple of fights, I just started putting it all together. And then I try to keep my practices not as long. So if, if it was like, If I was doing like my boxing, it always had wrestling in it. If I do kickboxing, it always had wrestling in, in it, you know. And the only thing that I um, started doing more is like I would like get my MMA sparring in, but like not where I'm trying to kill my partners or, you know, it's more like flow spar. But as soon as you hit the ground, you're going hard, you know. Then then by that time, I had my own students and um, I had a couple pro fighters. I had a whole bunch of amateurs. So I had plenty of training partners to train with, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, weight training, not so much at the time? Or did you do a lot of weight training as well? I always did a lot of well, weight training. I just never lifted really heavy. There's one part in there I did lift heavy. And uh, I was training with uh, this coach, uh, Giovanni. 
And then uh, he was like, you know, he did a lot. He had me do a lot of powerlifting, but then I started getting some some bad injuries. I tore my hamstring and stuff like that. So I I, I had to take a step back. Oh, okay. From yeah, yeah. The heavy lifting, but now like even now like I'm always high rep. Um, you know, really no breaks. I keep my heart rate up pretty high when I lift weights. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah. I remember being being a, a teenager and and designing my own training programs and sometimes you think oh, no 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 i know what to do for myself but then it's like it's very good to have something someone specialized to help you with because i used to do stupid stuff after i watched there was this movie from shaw brothers called the shaolin temple not the one with jet lee yeah, but I... another one yeah another one from shaw brothers and there was this guy who wanted to jump very high so he want he used to put like ankle weights like a ton of ankle yeah. weights and he would jump every day and after a year you would take them off and then he woo he leaped so i watched that and i was yeah. like okay my retarded brain was like yeah let's do this so every day i would yeah. jump for 10 minutes as if i were in a concert with that stuff on believing that i was gonna be jumping higher but just like you said once you found out how to train correctly and do the bleachers which is which is uh, very much what i what i discovered as well which is not exactly bleachers for me, but it was something like the, the plyometrics, you know, in which you jump very hard or very explosively for like uh, 10 to 20 seconds, but then you rest and then you jump all over again until you get that uh, explosion. Because one of the things I, yeah. I love, mo I mostly love about you is the kicking power and uh, the explosion. You're so explosive. E even when you do the takedowns, it's so explosive. And uh, I, I, by, by watching your Instagram, I can see that you still maintain that. So uh, I'm sure that's, that's not a, a very uh, easy thing to maintain along the way. So what differs, what mostly differs from those days to now in terms of uh, working out? What's your typical day for you right now? What changed? I mean, I still train pretty much um, the same, but everything's shorter. Everything's more condensed, right? Um, you know, everything's like, you know, being in the gym, if I lift, I get up and I shadow box. and um, Or if I do leg extension and the bag's there, I'm kicking the bag. Or I'm using, like, the spar bar or the, you know, punch king where I, if I don't have someone holding the pads for me, then I'm, I'm, I'm super setting where I'm doing one minute on one machine, one minute to another, or 30 seconds on 30 seconds to another machine, or 30 seconds um, hitting the bag, and then 30 seconds like lifting, you know, um, some dumbbells or jumping on a bench and just like doing like high reps until, you know, it, it ranges from 30 seconds to 45 to one minute, but I'm going like without any breaks for. A good 15 or 20 minutes wow you know, then, then like circuit you know, I, training I would yeah call it yeah like i would then i would call it but then when i come in to spar i would spar then afterwards i'd go and hit some some mitts or some pads and and then drill a little bit and that's it you know and now working with my son you know i make sure he doesn't overtrain. you know i flow a lot i flow spar with him a lot and then you know i get some wrestling in with him and then i i'm getting um some of his uh wrestling um teammates uh, to train as a group, you know, and then um, he's able to train with kids his size and his weight and, you know, and they're older than him. So he's getting, you know, a really good wrestling in. But then the stand up, you know, it's always like, hey, control yourself. Go, go easy, you know, lighten up on the power because he's just got he's got like, you know, um, the DNA, the yeah. Kung Lee DNA. Young so. blood. <laughs> the, yeah, the yeah. DNA. <laughs> How old is he? <laughs> He's 15. 15. Ooh, good age, good age. Yeah, yeah. Good age. <laughs> Keep him away Beats. from the chicks for now. Let, let him continue. Because yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. once he finds out, it's like, what? <laughs> Dad, you'd been holding this on me. <laughs> yeah. Is everything okay? Yeah. Are you okay? No, yeah, it's good. Just oh. my wife tell me she'll be done. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I know that uh, I know your wife. Uh, say hi to her for me, by the way, because I know she does your nutrition, right? Yes. So yes, you never really worried nutrition. about your nutrition. So now she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Come here, Kong. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. What, what, what has yeah, changed? I mean, What's changed I in your sure diet? Everyone, yeah. everyone, I, I want to make sure everyone thinks that I'm not drinking a beer. It's just kombucha. Kombucha. Right? So, kombucha. Yeah, yeah. 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 There you go. Nice. So what's your typical eating day for you now? Is, has it been hard to, to follow this nutrition protocol now that you have someone to follow you? Well... 
Um, yeah, I mean, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I like the, the junk food. I like the pizzas. Oh, but, me too. Um, um, I, I, I just, you know, I just got to make sure every two hours I'm trying to eat something. And um, whether if I'm eating uh, protein, it's with vegetables. Um, and then uh, um, we're doing a lot of, like, vegetable juice, um, a lot of greens, a lot of beets. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't taste that great but it's <laughs> you can tell so uh, it keeps me lean and um uh you know it's just a diet and then i usually have um like two cheat two cheat um meals but now she's like just go and have a cheat day so you don't do it the next day but like halfway through the day i'm eating and then because you're so healthy you start getting like sick so you start doing less of it so yeah. i notice i've been eating a lot less of junk food you know um so she, uh, whatever she's doing it, it's definitely it's definitely working yeah because uh, once you get accustomed to a diet uh, not even call it diet but to daily uh, uh, or nutrition habits or once you change your nutrition <laughs> habits uh sometimes you actually kind of feel fuller and you start uh, managing more and not having as much cravings but uh, i'm like you man i, I started I started with a, a rough and bad foundation because I ate whatever I wanted, so nobody was following or accompanying me. So uh, yeah. yeah, nowadays I'm a little bit more mindful of what I eat, but it's still, it's it takes all those days that it takes to get on the wagon that are, are really tough to to then keep going. Yeah. Do, do you drink any alcohol or stuff like that at all? Every once in a while, no. I drink wine once in a blue moon, you know, um, yeah. and you know, if some special occasion. You know, you know, I, I drink a little hmm. okay. a cognac or something with the with the uncles and <laughs> and the family. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it's like nice. I sip it, and they're like, they're while they're talking, I'm, I pour it in someone else's cup. You know, <laughs> so. What was what was the your peak moment in your career? I'm gonna say it probably was like Frank Shamrock, right, in Strike Force, or yeah, do you no, have any I other think, one in uh, mind? Well, you know, right before that, I was. Uh, doing really well in the in with scott coker right it was uh, hard to find opponents and then um then uh then when i got into mma you know you know i was just fighting with the with the mma rules and then um you know i i felt like uh uh with uh, the training over ak and then you know uh, putting me up with some you know um like not killers uh, but some good opponents where i was able to experience and learn Then uh, you know my fifth fight was against Frank Shamrock, so I was like, okay, let's let's do it, let's go, you know. And then um, I, I just, I again, I just feel I feel blessed for, you know, all my experiences and all the opponents that I've had, and uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it's it's been a good run, and uh, now I'm just just working on uh, you know producing and and uh, you know action directing and uh, you know starting up uh, you know my own. Uh, uh, shows and uh, educating people about fight or fight or flight, you know. Yeah. In, in the world we live in, so. Do you need a stunt man? Count me in. I'll, uh, I'll go tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> If you need a stunt yeah, man, yeah. let me know. Of course. Uh, so how was this? Soon as this, uh, soon as this BS. Yeah. You know, oh man, don't we, even get me started on this again, shit. And again, we should really talk about this so people can wake up. Yeah. Um, excuse my bit me, but. You gotta wake the fuck up. Yeah, it's. I mean, if you do your research, it's out there. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of controversial things, um, but if you do your research, you know, you'll you'll see. I mean, why why are we wearing masks when there's already scientific studies uh, saying that you know the mask makes it worse for our health, you know, and uh, it doesn't even really protect you. You know why? Control. Well, that, that's so, so. that's highly controversial, and I was once yeah. a believer that the mask was a great help. I, I still believe that in a couple of situations it might help. That's my belief. I don't know. But if you're like me or like most people who carry their masks on their pocket and then it's like, oh, where the fuck is it? Where the fuck is it? Oh, no, it's, it's over there. Then it falls on the ground. Then it stays up. Then it's like... That then it's on the car full of, 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 of shit in the car and stuff like that. And then you put it on. It's like... 
wow, I'm going all of I'm going through all of this bullshit every day to put on the mask and maybe I'm doing a dis uh, I'm I'm just doing a, uh, a disservice to myself and others because I'm actually having a harder time breathing and uh, a lot of uh, bad stuff might come from that. Uh, and besides, I'm already keeping distance from people. Why the hell would I have to uh, uh, be, uh, you know, like, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, no tolerance for those who don't wear a mask. That's so stupid. That's so stupid. Yeah, I mean, as you see, you see the stuff going on in Australia. Um, you see the stuff going on now. It's like it's all over social media. You know, like I just this morning, I was like, I woke up and I was just I go through the news part and I was like, why is this mom at a uh, at at her son's high school game? Um, being dragged off and tased by a, uh, um, uh, I guess a COVID officer. Um, what? Because she was what wasn't wearing a mask. Oh man! And she was six feet away. She was with her family, and that's her family. She's in the center. She wasn't wearing a mask. Maybe I didn't see before that, but you know now people are like, don't fight. But like first of all, if the cop comes and they they have to explain to you what they're gonna do, or you put on your mask. But they shouldn't just grab you and drag you, you know, um, things like that. That that stuff starts revolutions, you know. You know, like if I was there and that was my wife, you know, I guess we're both we'll both be in jail because I would not let anyone, you know, um, you know, or I'd be in the hospital. I don't know. Uh, but if someone's gonna put hands on my wife, but you know, wrong person to. Put hands in. And, oh, yeah, sure. you know, how many cops are going to take to take me down? Yeah, yeah. But I'm cracking yeah. them. Yeah, know? it, it but, is what it is. But I, I like. I'm going to protect my family. I don't care who it is. I I love you know? I love how honest you are and outspoken about that because you're actually one to say when they did good, but you're also one to say when they did bad. And nowadays, yep. I'm not even sure how it stands right now, but I believe everybody hates police officers nowadays and it's like whoa 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 come on just because of a few bad apples it doesn't mean that they all are fucked up what do you think about all this no, look, I, i have a i have a lot of old students that are cops mm -hmm. and they're actually you know uh, i have a family member that's a cop so and and uh, i i feel that their heads in the, and their hearts in the right place but then there's a couple of those like you said bad apples right And that makes everyone looks looks bad, but at the same time, you got to look at what's going on, right? How come there's certain things that are like Antifia? How come are there? How come they're able to get away with so much? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. How come now? You know? Hey, you know? I, I know a lot of people are 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 starting to see these groups. They're acting like terrorists. You know? Yeah, it's like um, malicious. They're forming but, malicious. I'm watching that and yeah, I'm like, what so, the fuck? Why does the news only cover? Why do the news only cover when police act like uh, uh, when 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 there's police brutality, no uh, no crowd brutality whatsoever? Come on, I mean, it's like you can't be with you can't form this society that is boosting up victimization to a high degree. I mean, everybody's a victim well, nowadays. What the fuck, right? It, here's the thing: it's division. Yeah, right. Whoever is behind this. They want the division, but there's a lot of good, like, like I also, I, I own the site fight or flight exactly yeah. official.tv. Right. And then, um, it, it has a lot of good press, like, w like good things that the cops do, like saving a baby's life. And a lot of cops do a lot of amazing things, but those are hidden, but they're why is the media showing certain things and they're not showing the overall picture. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a really touchy subject, but if you see who's funding the Antifia group and you see who's funding even, uh, you know, the black lives matter, who, who's funding it, do your research. I love, I, I love the, what they stand behind, but now what were they really standing behind? Is it violence? Is it, what's going on how come i see all this stuff that you know they're like terrorizing people at restaurants and and they're getting in police officers face you know i i don't understand and uh but 
Because, oh, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. I did my research, and it's it's. You know it's what scares me stuff. the most is that a lot of people will not go uh, through um, internally. People will start to become all extremes as well. So a lot of people are starting to get bipolar, and I don't mean just in the therapeutic sense. I mean. You're either very happy and, and enthusiastic or you're either depressed. You know, the the gray area, the in-betweens is starting to die. You're either with us or you're against us. You're either this, you're either left or you're either right. You're either uh, either Black Lives Matter, either uh, uh, MAGA, uh, either this. I, I mean, so the ability to focus and to focus on a task will be uh, more and more useful, I believe, for success. And I believe that people like you who have done it and who have had a, a, a very uh, a, a very full career and opportunities came, but you were ready for them because you were always focused on your task. Uh, so how do you instill that in the youngsters, the, the ability to focus on the task? What do you say to them? Well, you know, first of all, I, I, I got to be that role model for my son. Right. And um, and I and I see how things are completely different than when I was his age. And, uh, you know, many years ago, I didn't have that cell phone. I didn't have the social media. So I didn't have to worry about that. But now with social media, it's like a double edged sword. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. on one edge. You, you get real media. On the other edge, kids are getting depressed because of follows, because of yeah, um, likes, what follows. their friends are, you know, getting yeah. and they're not getting because of social media. So it's, 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 it's like um, it's, it's, it's a tough time to be a parent if you're really involved as a parent. But there's a lot of parents that are not involved, and that's why they have all these kids out there that are running around and abusing elderly people with bricks, and, and they're filming it, and they're getting caught because their parents didn't teach them right. They didn't teach them from right from wrong. And, you know, as the Bible says, they are the one who's supposed to lead, you know, and they are the, they are the children that will lead tomorrow, and... And but at the same time, people don't realize there's going to be them leading without us giving them the experience to lead, you know. Yeah. And so we all have to be responsible. It's a it's a team effort. And with what I see in the the youth, it's like it's it's scary. It's yeah. like wow, this is what what's going to run tomorrow. I mean, there's a lot of very smart kids and and um, they they try to help and expose certain things and their accounts are getting shut down and they're seeing all this and they're picking up on a lot of stuff and you know what I'm talking about the yeah, craziness that's out there the dark stuff that's out there mm -hmm. and um, those are the guys that are leading but then we also have to teach the ones that are You know the ones that are not the scholar, the ones that are going to be the ones that are to the, that fight, right? A lot of parents want the best education for their kids, but they don't want the they they forget about the best survival, the the best um, you know education to survive in today's world that will be tomorrow, you know, and that will. Who, who will lead tomorrow? Yeah. So that's, you know, there's a lot of elements that are, well, you know, us as parents around the world are falling short on because we're too consumed with what we're doing as, as adults and, and too, not worried enough to put that time and effort as parents, you know. I'm not speaking on, like, there's a lot of parents that are great parents, right? But I'm talking about majority. Look. If you if you look around you, and you, are you even looking at your kid's phone? I I I, I my my kid's 15 years old. Show me all your pictures. Show me her, and he's just like, okay, dad. And I'm like, <laughs> what the hell is this in there? Well, you know, my 
girlfriend sent that to me. I'm like, okay, well, you know, you got to understand all this is going to go away because your grades are not A's. <laughs> you can have this if you get A's, you know. So you got to, you have to kind of like, you can't just cut it off on them and they'll be angry at you because you have to learn how to fit in with them because this is, they're, they're going through this. And at the same time, we didn't go through what they're going through now. We went through what we went through back then. So we kind of have to understand how important it is for them to be accepted and to, you know, kind of like make people, um, you know, uh, look at them a certain way. But at the same time, you can't just chop that and tell them who cares what they think. It's what you think. It's what what you will do in the future that will make a difference. Don't worry about petty, sh excuse my Vietnamese, but don't worry about petty shit right now. Yeah. That's petty. Who cares? Work hard right now. Get your grades. Understand the education. But at the same time, you want to educate them in survival as well, not just in school because like there's a lot of stuff I learned in school. I, I'm, I'm not using it. Sure, I, I learned to balance my checkbook. I know you know, when I'm getting ripped off or not, but like there's some of the history stuff and some of the like other stuff that I, I've never used once. So, so for me, I, I want to educate my son more as in, Hey, here's gun safety. If you handle the gun wrong, lives are at stake. But if one day something happens to me, you, you know how to defend yourself. Or if someone's in and, and it's just you and me, and we are, you know, dealing with Antifia, trying to break in or doing something. We know how to defend ourselves because a lot of people like on, on the Internet, and I thank you to all the fans that will say, well, Kung, you don't need a gun. You got your kicks, but I'm not bulletproof. <laughs> and it's not going to be like, give me a second. You know, let me put on my armor. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> I'm going to run and online and order a, uh, uh, bulletproof face mask, you know, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's just, you, <laughs> well, Hey, you have to educate yourself because look at what's happening. You know, I just wrote down what you said because I, I, I love these topics. So the first one is you make people stronger and not, uh, make them weak victim, weak victims that always blame others for their mistakes. So, the second yeah. one, uh, this is what I got from, from, from all of this. Let, let, let me see if I'm correct. The second one, so always teach them, teach them the why. So they, it's not just about being strict or taking their cell phone or saying, no, 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 you got to get, it's why. Because in due time, they will see, and this is the third one, the helicopter vision. So having someone to be really after them or with them or accompanying them from a place of love so they see that this person is really dependable and someone to, to trust, trustworthy, in order to have a great helicopter vision, a great seeing things as a whole, which we uh, as teenagers were terrible at as well. So everybody until they're like 30 or some people even at the age of 50 don't have a good helicopter vision. So that was that was great stuff. That was that was intense. I love I love those tips on on parenting, on taking care of each other. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I would just uh, like to ask you just a couple of questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna finish. Sure, no problem. Um, about the the, I have to ask you about the movie business a little bit. So, uh, how did the the movie business come about? How did you start uh, getting into movies? I just happened, uh, you know, with with what I was doing, how I was fighting. Um, it just came to me, right? Some some Hollywood managers saw my fight against uh, Tony Fricklin. And, and uh, you know, um, right away reached out to me. I went out there and, and met with the manager and, and the agent, which I, I'm still with today, the agent, but not the manager. And, and uh, you know, um, kind of like how you maneuver through Hollywood is also, um, you know, uh, as an Asian American, it, it's tough as well. But it's how, it's how thick your skin is and it's how you um, want to be... Uh, better than not just what you're going to get hired by someone else, right? You want to take your vision to another level. Like for me, being a world champion doesn't mean that 
you know, the the the, the knowledge stops. You got to grow in not just the fight arena, but you got to grow as a uh, like a father. You got to grow as a parent. You got to grow as a businessman. You got to grow as an entrepreneur, and you got to grow as a producer. You got to grow as an actor. So you take all those elements, and you say, Do I want to work for someone for the rest of my life, or do I want to do something that makes like people understand a character, you know, and a character arc that they can get behind and they can follow and they they can share in the moments of happiness and sad and and uh, and growth in the character and maybe if there's a message to be said about certain things uh, which um, God willing when I do these projects it's it's more like um, to uh, to give that message mm, where yeah. we're at and how things with you know how of course action will be part of it yeah because i know you've turned the, time, you turned uh, you yeah. turned out a, 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 um you turned uh, turned down a, f a few uh roles because uh in, in a way maybe your artistic sense would be like why am i going to be doing more of the same or getting beat up by the same guys ever, over and over right so it's really yeah. about the artistic expression for you it's not just the wow i'm going to be in the movies i'm going to be famous so it's not You're all, yep. all, already very famous in the in the fighting world, obviously, but uh, uh, we know Hollywood is a totally different story. But uh, but still, it's yeah. it's very good of you to actually be able to no 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 I'm going to turn this down because this is not me. This is not what I want to do, and um, I believe yeah. that you you have a very nice print on camera. Uh, not only to be a lead actor, but also to be ob obviously a bad guy, you know, because fighters are way too intense and you're an intense guy. Um, but uh, not all fighters translate very well into movies because they're used to even technically speaking in terms of fighting. Fight choreography is a whole different animal. So it's like instead of going very short or very effective on the movements, you want something more ample. So I believe that Kung Fu... Uh, helped you a lot and maybe Taekwondo as well because they're more ample martial arts. So how, how was it translating the fights that you did in the ring to the ones that you did in the movies, for example, with Donnie Yen? I mean, I love that fight. Well, you know, that, that fight actually, uh, me and Donnie, we, we had another fight um, action uh, director and the fight took place 80% indoors. And I kept on telling Donnie, hey, we got We got two blocks, two and a half blocks of 1905 Hong Kong. How come we are not cranking parkour? We're not like doing like some amazing stuff outdoors. We're in a fish market. You're fighting each other with bamboo sticks. You're doing about a dozen reverse punches on me. We should be doing like stuff that really that we can really do in real yeah, life. Using right? the using the the elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then so. Um, So we took a chance. I came back and I filmed a, a pickup week, a whole week. And we had that, that fight scene between me and Donnie at one best action in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong Film Festival, which yeah. is like the Oscars here, you know. And then, um, then where I really got a chance to express my own knowledge and vision through the fight game was Dragon Eyes, you know. Uh -huh. And um, with Dragon Eyes... Um, I, I realized it was a lot of work because I was a lead actor, but at the same time I was putting together all the action, and it won it won some awards. It, it beat out like um, Gina Carano's, uh, uh, who was directed by uh, Steven Soderbergh at the Action Film Fest. We got Best Action, and then J.J. Perry, who directed, uh, I mean, a second uh, uh, action directed the the fight between Gina and Michael Fassbender. We we beat there their fight out but they came in third i had two fight scenes that had was first and second so i and then from there you know um uh, the next movie i got a chance to be the star in i should have took a little bit more control over the fight scenes but i let um my my coach at the time who was on um dragon eyes with me because the the, the character that i was playing was uh, uh um, you know uh, you know like a vet that had you know, PTSD. So the role was more demanding. So I said, Hey, can you try to run all the fight scenes? And we, you know, the fight scenes were great, but they weren't dynamic, like dragon eyes. What, when I really put like craziness into it and like more of like the, 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 the fighting style, then 
I looked at it as looking at like puncture wounds. Um, I could have been with my fighting style, but then I said, okay, what, what would, what would the military do? This uh-huh. is what they, they would do as in how they would fight, how they would, you know, so I just kind of implemented that trying to stick to the, the character. I could have just, I should have just say, this is who Kung Lee plays and that's the, the skill set. Then it would have been probably more dynamic, but that, you know, um, you know, it, I got, I got experience to play two leads and then, um, you know, I, I got some input on Pandorum where I, I was like, you know, the guy who saved the day with uh, Ben Foster's in the movie, Dennis Quaid, you know, Antia. I love um, Dennis so Quaid, it yeah. Was, uh, it, it was, uh, it was a, a lot of great um, experience and then train, uh, doing movies with like uh, Master Wu Ping, you know, um, in, wow. in uh, uh, True Ping. Legends and, um, and then Grandmasters and working with, um, you know, Wong Kar Wai. You know, he like wow. everything that he films is like a painting, and um, <laughs> you know, just working with Corey Yoon on the Man with the Iron Fist. I mean, I, I've gotten so much experience, so I decided, you know, like, uh, wh- where am I going to go with is that, you know, acting? How am I going to represent the Asian community? Am I going to be that Yakuza or the Chinese triad guy who's always getting killed, or am I going to, you know, am I going to do something that can, you know, stand out? You know, because. You know, I, I'm still physical. I'm, I, I'm tactical. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I can, I, 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 so I started writing. I started writing and now I got a couple scripts where, you know, I just got a letter from, from Vietnam to invite me over there to, you know, see how I can work together with Vietnam and, you know, maybe look into getting some investors. I, you know, I had a couple scripts, but I'm, I'm kind of moving these scripts in a different way. Uh-huh. I don't want to give too much away but you know um uh, thank you god for for the opportunity and you know um with god before me nothing can stand against me so uh if it's uh, if this is what he wants it, it's gonna happen so you you couldn't get that that artistic intuition that sharp without watching a lot of movies so i lay it on me which type of movies did you watch growing up and stuff like that were you a huge bruce lee and jackie chan fan and stuff like that who are your heroes oh yeah oh yeah you know actually you know um i started out 36 chambers of shaolin oh, like Lord Lord. You, 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 right five deadly venoms you know Um, then Four the brothers. Bruce Lee came in. Hmm? A, a lot of the Shaw brothers, you know, like the Fist of the White Lotus. You know? so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was cool because as soon as, like, when I did the Mount Iron Fist, Rizzo's off, I want you to be like the Toad in Five Deadly Venoms. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to be like Kung Lee, but I'll be kind of like the toad, you know? So uh, it it was good. Uh, You know, just because I watched a lot of movies doesn't mean that I can, you know, put it into a vision and create something special. I think I have to, like, all glory goes to God. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it, is what's happening now with all of a sudden I'm writing these, you know, scripts and people are like, you wrote this? No way. I'm like, yeah, I did. And then everything that's happening now, I think it's just God's plan. Like I, I used to be like, all right, what's my plans? This is my goal, and this. I'm like, you know what? I just kind of toss that out. And every day when I wake up, I'm like, okay, God, what do you need me to do? I'm ready. You know. So, huh. so yeah, God warrior, God's whatever. You know, clean up, do whatever. I'm I'm here. Excellent. I'm ready to serve. It, it's funny so. how everything comes together, right? It's funny how it's it's like there's really this godly plan. So I'm sure religion or faith is a huge component, and we're gonna finish off with this uh, of, of of the mental fortitude that that is Kung Lee. So, um, well, do you have any any sort of rituals, any routines like uh, stuff like uh, I get up in the morning and I meditate, stuff like that. I go for a walk. I vi- envision my day. Do you have any sort of routines, any mental uh, strengthening routines? Yeah, I do. Actually, at night and in the mornings, it used to just be meditation, right? Yeah. Now I'm mixing prayer with meditation. I've always been faithful with God. I mean, 
at a young age, my grandfather did a great job and kept my faith strong. And, 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 you know, I was able to talk to God for the longest time, but I kind of, you know, lost my way a little bit in my, uh, my, my last marriage. And, um, um, I'm, I'm now it's even stronger. I think I need to take from, learn from what I had to go through and then and move on. And now it's like, Hey, I, I'm, I see, I see the path now instead of before, like I wondering, oh, where do I need to go? What I need to do now? I already know. I'm just waiting for the time and being patient, like the sniper ready to, you know, take out two targets with one bullet. Incredible, sir. Thank you so much for this. Uh, this was a real treasure of, of, uh, of a chat. Uh, so um, I'm very glad that you that you had the, t the time to chat and to share with me some of your some of some of your intimate thoughts, which I think it's it's very good for the audience not just to know uh, the fighter or the actor or the producer, director, writer, whatever, but uh, also the person behind all of this because we are all human beings and we all resort. Uh, in a certain certain ways, either to our training, to our to our mental uh, aspect, and I really love when I get to connect with people and uh, get to know a little a little better how they got to where they got in terms of their performance and uh, where they get their vision. So thank you so much for this little bit. And if you have any message that you would like to leave or any plugs that you would like to do for some of your projects, lay it on us. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, I guess the first uh, thank you for the interview. Um, thank you, God, for today. And thank you to all the fans um, for all the support and people who uh, who maybe is going to see me for the first time today. Um, hello. And uh, <laughs> uh, be safe. Do your research because uh, don't live in that bubble. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. Wake up. Yeah. Open yeah. mind at all times. Kunle, thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. And uh, uh, I'm gonna let you know when this comes on, and I'm gonna show you the link because it's gonna be on my English channel, and it's gonna be on my Portuguese channel as well because I got a lot of followers in Portugal and Brazil, so they all uh, are huge fans of MMA, UFC, Strike Force, and whatnot. So they're gonna love to hear a little awesome. bit more about you with subtitles in order not to miss a beat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.